from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the Southern Oregon Television Program of the Year and the Best Education Show for 2017. I am producer and host John Letts. Ramping Up Your English is an instructional support program for intermediate level English learners. Now, if you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and you want to reach higher levels of English proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs and get you closer to your goal. Ramping Up Your English is for English learners from all language backgrounds and for people of all ages. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Native Americans. This is segment one of episode 83. Let's begin segment one with some language work. In our last episode, we listened to some stories that gave us insights into the attitudes and beliefs of some Native American groups. We heard the remainder of the creation story that the Cherokee people have, and we enjoyed a story written for children about the first part of a journey taken by a family in the country of the Pitt River Indians in Northern California. We'll hear more of their story from Indian tales. We'll hear many stories in this unit, but right now we'll roll up our sleeves and work with the language we use to tell of events in the past. Now, our last episode included the fascinating discovery of objects left behind thousands of years ago in Cougar Mountain Cave in South Central Oregon, objects dated at 13,500 years ago. These objects tell us something about the people that used that cave such a long time ago. In a pre another previous episode, we learned to use the past perfect tense of verbs to tell of events, actions, and situations in the past in relation to other events, actions, and situations in the past. So today we're going to use the present perfect tense, that of verbs, to communicate the actions in the past that continue into the present or actions and events that happen more than once. First, let's do a quick review of the past perfect tense. Now we use the helping verb had. We paired the helping verb had with the past participle as seen in this example. People from Asia had crossed the land bridge. Now here are some sample sentences using the past perfect tense. People from Asia had crossed the Bering land bridge before ocean levels rose. Ocean levels had risen when ice, the Ice Age ended, and many Americans had hunted megafauna before those animals became extinct. Some early Americans had populated America before the Clovis culture. Early Americans had found new food sources after the extinction of America's megafauna. Now, the present perfect is another way of telling about events situations and actions from the past, but this time we use the present tense of the verb have as a helping verb, along with the past participle of the verb we're using to tell about an action, event, or situation that started in the past and is still taking place or that has occurred several times. Now here are some examples of using the present perfect tense. Hold on a second. Did I do that right? Native Americans? Yeah. Okay, so Native Americans have adapted to many changes in the climate. They have found ways to survive despite serious challenges. And tribes have often moved to new areas due to climate, environmental change, or conflict. Most Native Americans have developed deep connections to the land on which they live. Most Native groups have learned to respect the animals, plants, and other elements of their environment. Some Native Americans have built large cities in numerous parts 
of North America. Now, in order to get comfortable with the present perfect verb tense, I recommend doing some homework. Think of things you started doing in the past and continue to do. Also think of things you've done several times. Practice using the present perfect tense using the helping verb have with the verb that names your action in the list of past participles. In many cases, that will be the same as the simple past tense. You could say, for example, I have gone to school for many years. I have cooked breakfast every day this week. I have visited a museum. Now, you can also change the subject and do the same thing. You have gone to school for many years, or we have visited a museum. Now, practice like this will make the use of present perfect tense verbs easier and less intimidating. Now, there is one thing. The helping verb have changes to has when using the third person singular form of the subject. That would be for the words it, he, or she, or the name of a person. An example would be, Mary has always gone to church on Sundays. Now, don't worry about the grammar labels. It's more important to get your ideas across when relating events from the past or events that recur. Uh, now, terms such as perfect and participle and such things can be confusing, and they are not worthy of your focus. The important thing is that you use the forms of verbs that best get across the ideas that you want to communicate. Beyond that, recommended practice, don't focus too much on the verb tenses as such. The main way we learn a language is through patterning. Our brains are great at picking up language patterns, and after a time, this all becomes more natural. You won't be thinking about verb tenses, you'll be thinking about what you want to tell someone, and your words will come out correctly because they'll just sound right to you. So listen and read. That's how you'll pick up the patterns you'll then use when you speak and write. Now, let's learn more about the past that we're learning to describe. While we've already learned about the first Americans through discoveries in Oregon, there were discoveries in the past that convinced many experts that the first Americans arrived around 12,000 years ago, the Clovis people. Now, while these people are no longer believed to be the earliest migrants to America, it's still important to learn about them. Professor Roberto Valdez in New Mexico produced a great presentation about the Clovis culture and other Paleo-Americans. Let's begin segment two of episode 83 by watching the part of his lesson devoted to the Clovis people. Greetings, I'm Roberto Valdez, Master of the Science of Geography and Instructor of History at Northern New Mexico College in Española, New Mexico. So Clovis Man is so named after uh, the location near the city of Clovis, New Mexico, although it's slightly closer to its neighbor Portales, New Mexico. The actual site itself is called Blackwater Draw. Now it's a drainage trough. Uh, situated on a vast, flat, semi-arid plain known as the Llano Estacado. So hunters used this trough, or arroyo, as a way to entrap their prey. they drive it into there, corner it, and then they would spear them. Uh, remains of many now extinct animals were found piled up and buried from the action of time at this uh, arroyo, or draw. Along with the bones of extinct bison and other animals listed herein, there were spear points that were lost and left in behind by hunters uh, embedded in the flesh of those dead animals. Their age was from uh, ranging from about 10,900 to 11,500 years ago. And it caused great excitement and can be visited today by you if you so choose. What's so clever about the Clovis Point is its design. This uh, invention was made from available flint found at certain locations in the eastern Great Plains. Its bottom mounts effectively on a shaft because it has a convex base in it. Um, um, and it's often found with at least a short length of fluting to accommodate a wooden shaft. 
let me give you some specifics. So fluting is when you knock out and thin out the layer of the of a shaft going where a shaft will be placed into it. And of course, there is the convex base here. So um, the Clovis points are still called Clovis points, even if they're found in other places in North America. Um, the one that I highlighted here at the, at the left, this one was found in uh, Berlin, New Mexico. Can you believe it? Now, at the left of this, you can see how this carefully shaped and chipped Clovis point mounts on the shaft, and it's secured with gum and uh, uh, and, and uh, sinew binding, which is the, the fibrous sinew binding that you can see on these particular samples. Many creatures, such as this mammoth, that shown on the main photograph, just too large to confront by an individual. But if you get teams of people cooperating, they're led by those with knowledge of the terrain, they could drive uh, collectively uh, uh, some animals into natural hazards, such as bogs, where in unison they could use their weapons to make a kill. Now, let me call your attention to a peculiar device that this man is holding in his arm. What in the world is that? Let's find out. Spear shafts weren't just thrust into an animal by sheer brute force. There was an invention that helped this out. And uh, uh, the, uh, anthrop there was a Mexican anthropologist pictured below at low left. Uh, her name is Zelia Nuttall. And she discussed the thrusting tool and called it an atlat. Atlat. Now I pronounce it again for you, atlat. The name atlat derives from the Nahuatl language of central Mexico where it was applied to a kind of lever tool that increases the thrusting power of a person's arm. The earliest known example was found in France, dated to around uh, 17,500 years ago, and it was made of a deer's antler. The atlat likely accompanied the uh, Paleolithic, Paleolithic people into North America from Asia. So, if I were to highlight here, for example, on this one is from a codex, of an Aztec codex showing that they were used quite late in time because they were a very excellent invention even though there was the bow and arrow by this time as well but in Paleolithic times there was no bow and arrow so people use this uh, uh, lever which of course you have your elbow you have your wrist and it's this is like adding an extra elbow and extra length of your arm which allows you to thrust in steps one two and three, launching at a large creature with increased force. The uh, name in, uh, in Spanish, tirar con tiradera, jugar con jugadera, or arrojar con arrojadera, is the translation that Zelia provided for atlat, which literally means the, a thing thrower, a sling thrower. The collection of uh, mammal species uh, of great height and weight are known as the megafauna, and remains are found even in Mexico. The kind of uh, horse uh, that existed was smaller than the horse that was brought from Europe later by the Spanish. There was a giant sloth, a short-faced bear, and other creatures that became extinct long ago. And this was due to two factors, climate change and hunters. A few creatures from that age still exist, such as the smaller version of the Ice Age bison called the American bison, uh, the American elk, the grizzly bear, uh, antelope, and even a smaller version of the armadillo. With my highlighter pen, let me um, call out some, uh, some of the creatures. Here's a giant sloth. Uh, here's the head of camelops. Look at this, the American elk. Look at the size of this armadillo or armadillo. And then we have here a pronghorn antelope, uh, the horse that existed back then. Here's bison antiquus, bison antiquus here. Uh, we have a uh, dire wolf. Look at the size of this lion here. You got the short-faced bear and what looks like the grizzly bear here. Now, relative to the height of humans, notice how high an imaginary human was by comparison. And these animals were being found, like I say, in Mexico. The largest of the creatures that went extinct was the woolly mammoth that looks like an elephant, but with short ears and an enormous set of tusks, 
as well as its namesake, that long and thick woolly hair. In the cold climate of the Ice Age and its conclusion, uh, when time changed into what we call the Holocene Epoch, the, there was this kind of a principle that could be applied. It was coined as Bergman's Rule. Bergman's Rule. And it was named after the German biologist Karl Bergman. This rule holds that a large body retains heat more efficiently, and as the animal's total size may be larger than its smaller counterpart, its surface area may appear to be greater, but not like its volume. It seems counterintuitive, but a larger animal stays warmer because a smaller portion of its surface area is exposed to the cold air. This is why so many Ice Age creatures were so huge, because they have a greater volume to surface area ratio. Another example of this is the Bison Antiquos. This creature is the larger Ice Age version of the present-day American bison. At the conclusion of the Ice Age and the beginning of the Holocene Epoch, this massive creature was hunted at great risk by the Paleolithic Indians. They followed the bison's migration in what are today New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Arkansas. Kill sites have been discovered in Oklahoma, where it was evident that small herds of these creatures may have been carefully partitioned from the main herd and driven by teams of people moving through the grass on foot into ravines and over cliffs. If the herd could be persuaded to stampede, the creatures would not have time to take evasive maneuvers. In this way, the Paleolithic people were using the bison herd's own stampede instinct, as well as knowledge of the terrain to confuse them, corner them, and kill them. During the warming period of the Holocene, bison got smaller, but were still impressively large, but as a consequence not as lumbering as the bison antiquos. The Camelops. Camelops was an interesting creature because uh, it lived during the Pliocene epoch and became extinct about uh, 10,000 years ago. Um, I can't resist showing you uh, what they looked like because it was one of the, those creatures hunted by a Paleolithic man early on. To the south and west of Santa Fe in a volcanic area, uh, a, a Camelops uh, was walking or trotting along a mud flat, leaving its tracks that were subsequently buried by another eruption of volcanic ash and preserved. And it was made into a visitor's display um, after its discovery in 1966. But because there was no caretaker and there were incidents of vandalism, this point of interest was deconstructed and the tracks were buried. But they were, for a 2001 study, uncovered, So, as you can see here in the photographs. Since the time of the Clovis discovery, new discoveries have been made, and after the mid-70s, uh, uh, new hypotheses were developed in the wake of finding these human remains and artifacts with earlier dates than those of Clovis. Uh, these were dates from 13,000 to 14,000 years ago, and they had to be explained somehow. So unfortunately, Clovis, uh, which is in New Mexico, has been dethroned as the earliest evidence of human occupation in North America. You're watching Ramping Up Your English. This is segment three of episode 83. Wouldn't you love to be in the class with Professor Valdez? It's a good time to point out an issue using a second language. Many places in southwestern North America were named by Spanish-speaking people. After all, these areas were once part of New Spain and then of Mexico. Well, some places have names that often have meanings in the Spanish language, and since these are Spanish words, I tend to pronounce them in Spanish, even while speaking English, as Professor Valdez does. Now, you may also notice that while his presentation was in English, he spoke English with a fantastic Chicano accent. Accents are an important aspect of becoming proficient in English, but it's not the most important thing. In learning Spanish, I worked hard at speaking Spanish with a generally correct Spanish accent. My goal was to make my communication in Spanish clear to native Spanish speakers. I don't always succeed, but I keep that as a goal that I work toward. Now, if you seek to speak English with an English accent, I have to ask, to which English accent do you aspire? 
Speakers from England pronounce some words very differently than they do in Nebraska or people from Sydney, Australia. So your choice may depend on whom you have as a language model. The older you are, the, hardest it is, the harder it is to change your accent. Now, that does not mean that you can't uh, advance in English. Not at all. The accent you bring from your first language may be a great match for English, as it was what we just heard from Professor Roberto Valdez. Deciding on which accent you want to have is mostly a personal matter, although pronunciation in itself remains important in being understood. And that's all I'm going to say about accents. Now we're going to do a little work in vocabulary. As a teacher, I often taught vocabulary prior to beginning a unit of study. This is called front-loading. It's a good practice, preparing students for what they'll hear and read. Nonetheless, front-loading is not the only time to teach vocabulary. The context of the unit itself can make learning more clear and helpful without first working to learn the vocabulary. I had a whole wall of words connected to learning about Native Americans. Today, we'll explore meanings of some of those words. Now, as you watch the episodes in the Native American unit, you may be unsure about the meanings of some of the words. You may also come up with your own theories about the meanings of some of the words based on what you saw in the videos and on the grammar work we've done. Well, this work is worth doing even if you miss the true meaning of some words. Making your own conjectures often results in greater retention, and there will always be opportunities for correction if you miss the mark. Let's start with the unit title, Native Americans. The word native refers to a person or other organism that is from a particular place or has occupied that place for a long time. Since the subjects of our unit lived in America long before Europeans arrived, they are considered native to America, while Europeans and other later arrivals are not Native Americans. Now here in Oregon, someone born in the state can claim to be a native Oregonian, as opposed to people like me who moved to Oregon from somewhere else. Now for the purposes of this unit, native refers to the first Americans and their descendants. Native Americans are also called American Indians. Now this is an interesting term. The continents of America were named after the famous navigator from Italy and the term Indian comes because Christopher Columbus thought he arrived off the coast of India. Well, the name stuck. Today many indigenous Americans have embraced the word Indian as a way to have power over it. They've made the word their own. Now the term Native American was intended as a more emotionally neutral word, but some see it as meaningless. As one tribal member put it, with that I feel neither Native nor American when I'm called a Native American. And that brings us to the word indigenous. Indigenous means to be from a place or part of a place and can mean belonging to a place. It's very likely that you already knew meanings of some of these terms, but if you were unsure, this short lesson should help you know that your knowledge was correct. And if you didn't know them, or if you were unsure, you can now continue with the unit with more confidence. We'll do more work with vocabulary as we progress through the unit. In this episode, we introduce the present perfect tense of verbs as a way of relating events, actions, or situations from the past that continue to occur. Present perfect verbs can also be used for actions that take place more than once. We also learned about people from the Clovis culture. In the next episode, we'll learn about the Folsom culture as we study Native Americans. Now, I love to hear from viewers. You can send me email at Let's Create pro at gmail.com. Be sure to visit my website, letscreate.org, to see the support materials for this episode, including that list of participles that were used with the helping verbs have and has to form the present perfect tense. You'll see the learning materials we used in this episode just 
uh, click on the link to the Native American unit and navigate to the episode 83 page. You can watch and even download this episode and more from archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. All episodes are there. Enter Ramping Up Your English in the search box and choose the episode you want. Ramping Up Your English can be seen on RVTV on channel 15 and 115 on the Ashland Home Network and on channel 182 in the rest of Southern Oregon on Charter Cable. You can stream Ramping Up Your English for free from rvtv.sou.edu. I want to thank my director, Denise Ross, and my talented and dedicated crew, and I want to thank you, our viewers. All of you helped make this program an award winner. Join me next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Join us next time on RBTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.